And I would say that we can already have the, the first speaker, that is uh, David, from uh, David Garçon Ramos from uh, Iridia, Brussels. And he will talk about uh, his work on uh, uh, automatic offline design of robot swarms, recent advantage and perspective. So, if, uh, David, you can already share. Yes. So, in the meantime, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be participating in this first webinar. Of, uh, so, um, good morning, uh, everyone. I, as I say, I'm really happy of uh, sharing our uh, perspective on the automatic offline design of robot swarms with you. I'm David Garzon Ramos. I'm a PhD student at Iridia, the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory of the University of Brussels. So we can start. To illustrate the idea of automatic of line design of robot swarms, I will start with a comic that was uh, sketched by my supervisor, Professor Mauro Viratari, about the Fiorella's gardening robots. So Fiorella is a PhD that already graduated in swarm robotics, and she wanted to start her own business using uh, robotics. So for that, she created these little robots that have different tools for doing the gardening tasks. So they have tools for uh, harvesting different kinds of fruit. They have tools for watering and cutting the plants. And they have tools even for chasing this uh, annoying mold that is making holes in the, in the grass in the gardens. So ideally, these robots have the capabilities to address any kind of combinations of these tasks to address these kind of missions. In this scenario, the customers of Fiorella can book her services by entering into her website. So there they can design or they can produce graphical representations of their gardens. They can indicate what tasks need to be done in their own houses. So one might expect that if Fiorella has many customers, they will have different kind of gardens with different sizes, different shapes. So the robot should be able to operate in a wide range of different missions. The thing is that for this business to, to actually be uh, profitable and actually to be sustainable, Fiorella will need to attend many customers during the day. So this is a huge limitation because she will not be able to devote like the two or three years that she devoted to program the robot during her PhD to just attend one single customer. So she will need to, she will need to find a technology. She will need to find a methodology that allows her to design quickly the robots and probably the only time that she will have available for doing this is the time that, uh, that she has from going to the place of one customer to the place to the, of, of the other. So ideally when she arrives to the garden of the customer, she needs to deploy and she needs to deploy the robot swarm and the robot swarm, swarm should act instantaneously. So she would not be able to ask the customer like two or three days for testing the robots and then cutting uh, the grass or cutting the flowers or harvesting the fruit. So the key components of this problem is that, are that first, there is a large number of possible missions, like many possible gardens that need to be uh, taken care by the swarms of um, Fiorella. There is very little time for designing because she needs to design these robot swarms in the, in the time that she has from one place for going one, from, of going from one place to the other. Human intervention is not possible because she is uh, basically starting this business and she's driving to the places so she has not somebody that can program the robots for, for her. So this needs to happen without human intervention. And finally, the control software cannot be tested. And I think this is kind of quite the nightmare of everybody that is working with robotics so that you have to deploy the robots and they should start operating without any prior test. Why we think that automatic offline design could be a prominent tool for deploying robot swarms in real life in the future? Because it is a technology that would allow automatically produce the control software of the robots while Fiorella drives the van. I will start first with an overview of swarm robotics. Robot swarms are relatively simple, simple groups of robots that collectively can accomplish tasks that a single robot could not accomplish alone. So these systems have some interesting characteristics. For instance, they operate without the need of leader, uh, of a robot leader or external infrastructure. They operate on the basis of locality. So robots only react and are, uh, to stimulus of local interaction with the environment and with their peers. These systems are redundant. So there is no predefined role for the robots and each robot could replace other robot that might fail or not. So this framework and these characteristics are conceived so that there are some desired properties achieved in the system. 
and these are fault tolerance. If one, two, or three robots fail in the swarm, the whole swarm is not affected. In the same way, it's a scalable system. So we could add or remove elements from the system without affecting considerably the collective behavior of the robot. And finally, it's a flexible system. It can cope with changes in the environment where it's operating. Recent discussions on the future of some robotics have sketched some milestones that can be achieved in the near future as we boost the use of robot swarm or probably in real world applications. Although at present, most achievements in swarm robotics research still occur in the laboratory, we are moving forward. And I think the, 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 the very best example of this is that there are, there, are new novel, uh, there are novel platforms that are now able to operate in challenging, in challenging scenarios like the Ingenuity uh, helicopter. So I, I think that it would be difficult to reach a point soon where we can send swarms of Curiosity rovers or swarms of Perseverance rovers. But I, I don't think that it's difficult to imagine that in the next um, uh, expl uh, planetary exploration missions, we could send large group of these uh, more simple helicopters to explore the surface of, of Mars. So this is a task that cannot be achieved by a single robot. So for sure, we need to send large group of robots to operate in those scenarios. We also expect that there will be a focus in possible applications. So, so far we have mostly we have been mostly concerned on what kind of collective behaviors can be achieved with robot swarms and how to achieve them. But we need to transition to what can be done with these collective behaviors that we are designing. And finally, there are new design methodologies that allow the realization of even more complex collective behaviors. And one of these possible uh, approaches is the automatic offline design of robot swarm. So, but how to design a robot swarm? And this is basically the main problem. So the collective behavior of the robots is defined at the swarm level. So we understand and we know more or less how the robot swarm should look like and how it should operate as a whole. But when we need to program the robots, we need to go to the individual level. And this is the, 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 the main challenge here. So how to design the individual so that the collective behavior emerges. There are some common approaches to this uh, design problem. The, the issue is that there is no general methodology to design robot swarms. There is no way to, there is no single way to say how a robot swarm should be programmed to perform a specific mission. It is a labor that traditionally have been done by manual trial and error. Although some principal methods exist and they are very valuable and have given insights, insight on how to develop systems uh, that are like robot swarms, they are mostly mission specific and do not apply in the general case. As an alternative, and more recently, there are methods that belong in the umbrella of optimization-based design of robot swarms. In optimization-based design, the design problem is cast into an optimization problem. In this case, an optimization algorithm explores possible configurations of the hardware and the software of the robots and selects the one that has the chance to perform better in a specific mission. So in the case of Fiorella, for instance, an optimization algorithm could explore what are the specific tools that the robots need or what is the specific software that the robots need to perform well in the garden of a specific customer. One of the, the main issues of this, um, uh, one of the main issues that remain in the field of optimization-based design is that there is not yet a common understanding of how to classify the method. So there are different classifications that have been proposed and there is a new awareness on how these things should be ad addressed so that it is possible to compare the characteristics of the methods. So in this classification, we've, we differentiate two big uh, groups. The first one is the contra contrast between online methods and offline methods. In online methods, the control software is produced in situ. That it means that the control software is produced in the robots while the robots are operating. So this has one uh, big limitation because since we need to do the things in the robots, there is no chance to explore large possible number of configurations. So these uh, online methods probably are better suited for fine tuning a collective behavior that already exists. Offline methods, on the contrary, can explore a large group of possible configurations because they, they produce the control software a priori and possibly in simulation. So these are probably better um, suited for cases in which we have a large number of possible configurations, like in the robots of Fiorella, 
and we need to select the one that performs the task. Then we have the division between semi-automatic methods and automatic methods. In semi-automatic methods, a human expert steers an optimization process to produce a collective behavior. So this is a, a, a methodology that is better suited for single applications in which we can devote a lot of resources and we can devote a lot of time to produce a single collective behavior. In the case of Fiorella, since she needs to actually produce many designs in a very short time, probably she would go better with automatic methods in which there is no need of human intervention and actually can produce control software in time and, con and cost constraints. I will focus now in automatic offline design of robot swarms. So we believe that automatic offline design will have a prominent role in the deployment of robot swarms in the future because it's, gen it's generally applicable. So it can be used in many different classes of missions, reduces effort as there is no need for human intervention. It allows quick realization of robot swarms because it can be performed in simulation and ensures sufficiently good performance as it is an optimization based method. In the research of automatic offline design or robot swarms, traditionally has been done by near evolution. A large part of the literature has been devoted to study this approach. In near evolution, the each robot is controlled by an artificial neural network whose parameters and architecture are obtained via artificial evolution. More recently, there are, there are some studies that have proposed the automatic modular design, AutoMod, that in which an optimization algorithm explores and selects and fine tunes pre-existing software modules that were probably manually designed and then combines these modules in modular control architectures like final descent machines and behavior trees. Going further and exploring further the idea of modularity, there are new hybrids in these uh, automatic offline approaches. For instance, there are some studies that propose that the pre-existing software modules could be produced by optimization, like by, via near evolution, and then these modules could be combined again in modular control architectures. The main challenge of working with automatic offline design is that the one of the reality gap. So the reality gap is a phenomenon that is caused by the differences between the simulation and reality and manifests in the performance drop in the design process. So here I, uh, I have an example of a foraging mission in which robots have the possibility to forage beneficial food and harmful food and uh, take it to the nest. So it's an abstraction of the mission. So this is a control software produced by near evolution in which the automatic design method produces a control software in which the robots follow the walls so that they can go directly from the nest to the beneficial source of food and come back. The problem is that when we ported this to the real robots, in reality, the robots were not able to follow the wall. This is probably caused because there, are a, there is a fine tuning simulation of the relationship between the proximity sensors and the wheels that cannot be reproduced in the real robots. The difficulty is that this um, performance drop is method specific. So there is no way to know whether a method can be more or less robust on uh, unless we try the, the two methods. So we have same mission with a modular design with AutoMod. The robots apparently in simulation perform worse because they have more collisions. They are not going directly from the nest to the sources. But when we port it to the real robots, things work better. So these differences in the performance drop across methods still is something that needs to, to be explored further to be understood. In ongoing research in the automatic offline design, we find that there are different trends or different lines that have been explored in the recent years. So with respect to the robots, we find that there are studies that explore the possibility of designing automatically robot swarms that exhibit direct and indirect communication capabilities. Robot swarms that can perform a pattern formation behaviors or that can operate in a unbounded spaces. With respect to the design process, there is research that is trying to uh, understand what is the effect of selecting one optimization algorithm or one specific control architecture in the automatic design method? How can we like, uh, extend this concept of modularity from software modules to also design robot swarms that can combine different hardware modules? And finally, how to predict and mitigate the effects of the reality map? In the future, 
There is a need for first establishing a well-recognized state of the art because so far there are no exhaustive uh, comparative studies across different methods. There are some open, open questions that we need to address, like how can we conceive a method that is effective or what components do make it robust to the reality gap? And finally, and uh, this is something that was proposed by one of the reviewers and we think that is quite interesting is how can we transfer this knowledge and these methods to other design problems or vice versa? So how can this technology be partially used in other domains, for example, in the design of single robot control software? Our vision is that automatic blind design is a key technology for realizing and operating robot swarm in daily life tasks and will have a prominent role in the future. So with that, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much. And now we'll be open to, to hear any question that you might have. Thank you very much, David. Very interesting. I am Monica Rodriguez. I'm the monitor in the chat. I don't particularly see questions, but uh, let's wait 10 seconds if a question appears. Otherwise, I will ask a quick one. A quick question I have is about, uh, um, let's say, using this approach outside of SWOT robotics uh, mm -hmm. for in other uh, robotics domain. Do you think it's possible? In particular, I'm thinking about ROS, that is a big effort in achieving uh, modularity among uh, uh, modularity in robotics. And so you already have modules written in ROS that are available for other researchers to use. Do you think this can be uh, integrated very easily in, uh, in automated design methodologies or there are challenges? Yes, so um, on the one hand, I, I, be, I really believe that using ROS uh, is, um, is a way to work here because as, as you mentioned, so ROS ensures the portability of the control software or let's say an easy portability of the control software between different platforms. So developing behavior that probably are platform agnostic using ROS should be something that interesting. So far, most of the studies are like, um, particularly suited for a specific robot platforms. And this is something that prevents that the portability of the methods. And it is difficult that, for instance, in our laboratory, we have epoch robots and we develop software modules that to some extent are agnostic and uh, like describe in a general way what should be the behavior, but they are deeply integrated on the capabilities of the robot. So if we move to ROS, if we move to a framework like ROS, we will be able to indeed reproduce the control software that is developed in a different laboratories provided by different researchers in new platforms. In the same way, we could further discuss what is the transferability of these modules or this control software, for instance, between uh, rovers and between flying robots or between underweather robots. So what are the similar similarities? What behaviors indeed can be transferred and which are not? So it, it's a super interesting uh, idea and I, I really would like to, to work with this. And for instance, Aniridia, we are trying to move slightly, I mean, slowly, but we are going to, to, to produce a software that is based on ROS for even small and single, uh, and like, like I said, relatively simple robots like the Apple. But yeah, I, I, I truly believe that we, we should include ROS into this, uh, into this problem to assure the transferability of the, of the methods and the behavior. Okay, amazing. Thank you very much, David. Very interesting. Okay. So let's make a virtual round of applause.